As we close out our time this morning, our third plenary speaker is uh, Mr. Mark Hare. Uh, Mark, uh, we had a couple, couple of years ago, we had Mark, uh, had the privilege of having him as one of our missionary in residence on the ECHO campus. And Mark is, is a missionary in Haiti where he actually works with an, a grass movement uh, called Farmers Movement of Papaya, assisting thousands of community groups in the country. Mark assists with groups of, uh, in Haiti uh, in developing diversification and integration of small, small animal production with vegetables and other crops. Uh, Mark is going to be sharing uh, his practical uh, experience with a program called Fondama, uh, yard Garden Program. Mark, we're very pleased to have you with us this morning, and would you join me in welcoming Mark as he comes to speak. Thanks, Tim. Good morning. Good morning. It's as simple as that. Wow. Um, it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, a little scary, but mostly good. So I, my name is Mark Hare, uh, and I've been working as a Peace USA mission worker, Presbyterian Church USA, since 1997. And I've been working in grassroots agricultural development, first in Haiti, uh, then in Nicaragua for six years, and then back in Haiti since 2004. And I also need to mention that I have been exposed to the creative disruption of ECHO since 1996. <laughs> and you'll probably be able to see that as, we talk, as I share some of the, the ideas that we've been passing on to people in Haiti. In 2008, uh, my life and my work got a lot bigger when uh, Jenny Bent from Nicaragua agreed to marry me and also agreed to moved back to Haiti and served with me in the work I was doing there. Since 2012, Jenny served officially with the Presbyterian Church USA and has been assigned to serve with the Evangelical Church of the Dominican Republic. Her focus is on how communities can address the root causes of their health problems. Our team got bigger in 2009 when the third member joined us, Kayla, she was born in Nicaragua, and by the time she was five months old, she had visited four different countries. Her first words were actually in Haitian Creole, but she doesn't remember them anymore. The fourth member of the team uh, came along in 2011, Anika. It took Anika a little longer to, be, to get the status of world traveler. She was eight months before she'd been to four different countries. We have a friend who told us that if they keep that up by the time they're four, They'll run out of countries. Since 2012, our mission team has actually lived in the Dominican Republic, which most of you know shares the island of Hispaniola with Haiti. Uh, Cuba is just up the street, and Miami is about 700 miles away. Our home in the Dominican Republic has been uh, Barahona, the municipality of Barahona, which is about three and a half hours from the capital. But more importantly, it's only an hour and a half from the border crossing into Haiti, Himani and Mount Pass. And that's the route that I took uh, almost every month for three years. It's also, Baron is also about 35 minutes from the community of Bate 7, a community of sugarcane workers, where Jenny's been serving as a consultant for community health. It was interesting when uh, Susan was asking people if they've been part of some sort of disruption or chaotic event, and most of the examples she gave, I was able to say yes to. Haiti suffered many, many disasters since it became a nation over 200 years ago. The one, probably the one that brought it to the attention of the most people was the earthquake in 2010. Most of you have probably also heard about the cholera uh, epidemic, which continues. Uh, it has affected over 700,000 Haitians and killed at least 9,000. The source of the cholera bacteria were United Nations troops who were sent to Haiti in the middle of a cholera epidemic in their home country. 
Politics in Haiti have also been disastrous or disruptive. At the end of 2010, preliminary elections were held for local officials as well as parliamentary posts and the presidency. Voter turnout was high, but so was voter fraud. In February of this year, parliament was disbanded and every elected post in Haiti had to be filled in three massive sets of elections. The first set was in August and the second just this past October. And on the ground reports in indicate that fraud was significant in both of them. Drought has also been causing problems, in part caused by the El Nino. Uh, many farmers have lost their crops this year, people I know, both seasons. And Rhoda Butler was telling me there are even places in Haiti now who are talking about having three years without significant rain. Besides these periodic disasters, there is also the daily suffering of Haitians day in and day out. Uh, over half the people in the rural country, in the rural side, in the rural countryside have limited access to clean water. Uh, there's also problems with nutrition, and as a result, Haiti has the highest infant mortality rate in the Western Hemisphere. So all of these things, one after the other, have tend tended to leave, lead people to ask a question, is there hope for Haiti? But I want to be clear this morning, I needed to say that because it's usually those are the kinds of things that people think about when they think about Haiti. But what we're going to talk about this morning is not is there hope for Haiti, but we're going to talk about the hope that is in Haiti. And we're going to look at examples of God's faithfulness and even abundance in the midst of very difficult and even chaotic conditions. And I didn't know Susan Stewart was going to almost say the same thing. Specifically, we're going to talk, as Tim mentioned, about the MPP Fondama Yard Garden Program in Haitian Creole Program, Jardin La Cour. And this program is about making small daily changes in a family's life that are consistent, persistent, and positive without being intrusive. And you probably can tell by that statement that I felt where I fell on the scale was pragmatist. Changes, but very small. And I think, from my experience, that's probably where farmers are. But before we can understand the Yard Garden program, we need to talk about the organizations that have helped create them that have helped create the program. One of these is MPP, the Mouvement Paysan Papay, or Peasant Movement of Papay. And I started working with them. They didn't start in 2004, they started in 1973. I started working with them in 2004. The name Papay comes from the small town where it began, which is about 60 or 70 miles from Port-au-Prince. And once I get over the border, about two and a half hours. It did begin in 1973 when a Haitian named Chavan Jean Baptiste came back to his rural community and began working in a Catholic diaconal center, training farmers in vegetable production. During that time, Chavan became involved also with two small groups of farmers who didn't want to just change their lives, but wanted to change the lives of their community. And so Siobhan began working with them in a, in a dynamic process of education, reflection, and action, which is a constant, has been a constant cycle for over 40 years now. And it's led to MPP growing from, more than, from those two small farmer groups to now it has over 2,000 farmer groups with around 40,000 members, men, women, and youth. MPP has also been extending its work to all parts of the country by connecting with other organizations. In 2009, it helped uh, establish an organization, a network called Fondama that we mentioned already. And Fondama is made up 11 development, a grassroots and one development organization working together to advocate for the restoration of the environment in Haiti and for food sovereignty. And I'm gonna plug my own organ, my Mission Sending Agency, that's part, is coming out of the Joining Hands Initiative, which is part of the Presbyterian Hunger Program. 
So when I began working with MPP in 2004, they, the leadership asked me to work with a project that came to be known as the Road to Life Yard and Moringa Project. And I usually have to explain what Moringa is, but I think of all places where I shouldn't have to, this would be one where I don't. So it's a shrubby tree that is very good as food. And the way I've been explaining this project is I've been using the concept of the refrigerator. Because over half the people in Haiti, oh, half of the families, uh, are still dependent on agriculture in Haiti, which for me is a good thing. But the reality is that those families don't have what people in the States are used to. They don't have a refrigerator to go to when they need food. And they also don't have a lot of supermarkets out in the, up in the mountains. So the reality for most, over half the people in Haiti at least, is that it are, the yards are their, their refrigerators. And the fields of the farmers are the supermarkets for the community. So our job was to try out new techniques that could help families keep those refrigerators stocked with more food and with the kinds of foods that are higher in vitamins and minerals and even protein. We based our work on what I call three uh, on agroecological principles, diversifying, integrating, and intensifying. And diversifying is pretty simple. We just mean that we're looking at new things that rural families could produce, they could add to their repertoires because they do have the space and they have the resources. And Moringa is a good example of that because Moringa is something that most Haitians already know about, but what they don't know is that you can, even though it's a tree, you can plant it very closely together, uh, the trees very closely together, and sort of treat it like a shrub, and it ends up producing quite a bit of food in a very small space. So it was something, it was that, it's the kind of idea that takes something people already know, but adds a new twist to it, that it adds something that they didn't have before. Another example are the vegetable tires. Uh, it turns out that if you take an old tire, cut it off, turn it inside out, fill it with good soil, you can grow a lot of food in it during a year. And it only takes a gallon or two gallons at most of water a day. And you can use uh, wastewater for that, bath by bathing water or wa water that comes out of, from washing dishes. What we, what we mean by integrating is that we're trying to pull every possible resource into a production system. For example, at the center where we were working, MPP's training center in Papai, we fed our goats leaves from hedgerows of trees that we planted to protect and renew the soils on our slopes. We took the goat manure and we composted some of it and we fed it to redworms. Redworms we used as uh, part of the food for our chickens. And then the manure from the chickens and the, the redworm compost, the vermicompost, became part of our system for growing vegetables. When the goats were done with the leaves, we took the branches and put them back up in the hills and reinforced our hedgerows. And we also built simple in-ground cisterns where we stored water and we put fish in the cisterns. So the fish ate the mosquito larva, larvae and we ate the fish. And then the water became our source of vegetable production during most of the year. So by diversifying and integrating, we were able to intensify the production, meaning that with more or less the same, resource, the same resources that were there already, we were able to produce quite a bit more food. We had about we were able to produce as much as 400 pounds of food in a year on about three quarters of an acre, in addition to goat forage. And uh, the area of land that we started working with hadn't been producing anything at all before we started. So one of the things that happened that was particularly important about that work at the center were that the people on the team started taking the ideas back to their homes. And we lease is a good example. We lease started growing vegetables in old tires by his house, and he started planting moringa. And what he talks about, this, 
the process that he talks about is what happened was neighbors would come into his yard and say, wow, that moringa looks really good. You know, I don't have anything to add to my rice today. Do you think you could give me some of those leaves? And Willis, of course, would say yes, or his wife would say yes. But then maybe a week later, the same neighbor would come back and they would say, you know, I have corn porridge this morning, but uh, I don't have anything to add to it. Could I have some of your amaranth? And Willis or his wife would say, yeah, OK. And then a week later, the same neighbor would come back, and Willis would say, look, you can have the leaves today, but the next time you eat leaves, they better be from your own garden. And then he said, if you need some help, I'll come help you. And so that started a process of the ideas that we'd started at the center moving up into the mountains, into the communities. And it was exciting. It was, um, it's like what's supposed to happen, but up till that point, I'd never actually seen it. So in 2012, in, when Jenny and my situation changed, MPP asked for my work to change in Haiti and for me to take the things that we had learned in Papai, including this process of, of the ideas moving up into the mountains, and take it to other farmer organizations that had fewer resources than MPP. And those farmer organizations were working together with MPP in this network called Fondama. And that's how the MPP Fondama Yard Garden Program began. So since 2012, when I go over the border, instead of going into to Papai, they sent me to work in the mountains of Leogan, about 30 miles west of Port-au-Prince, the mountains of Verret, about 60 miles north in the Artibonite Valley. The valley is very fertile. The mountains are very uh, not fertile. And also into the mountains of Bayonne, which is about 80 miles straight north and is part of the city of Gonaïve. So in each of those three zones, we worked with farmer organizations that had a unique history and a unique style that was specific to the people in them. But what they all had in common was this vision, this common vision of working together to, so that every person in Haiti could live with dignity. I need to go from Haiti back to the Dominican Republic because I started this process in Haiti in 2012. But in 2013, Jenny started working with a system of community development and community health called community health evangelism. And it, the things that I began learning together with Jenny transformed the work that I was doing in Haiti. In April of 2013, Jenny and I did our first workshop uh, first community health evangelism workshop, and Jenny began applying those in Bate 7, in the sugarcane community in Barahona. And as I worked alongside Jenny, I began sort of stealing the things I was doing there and taking them over to Haiti. One aspect that became particularly important was this idea of integrating strategies of evangelism and discipleship together with community health and development. That may not seem new to a lot of you, but I'm not maybe the typical mission worker, so it was a new concept for me. Um, but the way that Che does it is particularly significant. Another important aspect of Che was the structure that it uses to enter in and support community uh, health programs. And that structure includes in-country facilitators that are sort of the trainers for the whole country. And then inside the community, the community chooses a committee that becomes the, the leaders in developing the vision and the goals for the program. And then they have a team of volunteers who carry out that vision. And of course, you have the trainers who are the ones that take the information and the ideas uh, that, that we learn from the in-country facilitators and begin applying them uh, as we accompany the committee and the volunteers within the village. So in Haiti, I began thinking about that structure. And I began seeing the farmer organizations I was working with as the community. And that the leaders in the farmer organiz organization who had been selected by the members as sort of the Che committee 
And so I began understanding that my job was to work with the leaders in the farmer organization, helping them gain new knowledge, and, but also helping to train a core of uh, volunteers who were willing to put everything they had learned into practice. So it helped me to begin understanding how I should work and, and where I should go with the program. In both Haiti and the Dominican Republic, we took the text from Matthew 10, 5 to 8, as sort of the, one of the core texts, the core scriptures for our work. And in that text, you can see it says, These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. And that helped it to be very clear in my head that what we were doing, that our goal has been to follow Christ's example, has been to follow Christ's example, creating teams of farmers who understand that they have been called to be disciples, witnessing to God's abundance in their own communities. Another key text for us has been the creation story, and I've heard that mentioned a number of times now among speakers. It's particularly for us Genesis 2, 8 to 10 and 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to, care, to work it and to take care of it. And what we understand by that is that from the beginning, the Lord God has called us to be co-creators. In verse 7, it says, the Lord God planted the Garden of Eden, uh, planted a garden in Eden in the east. And the image as you work with farmers that comes from that is of God on his hands and knees, carefully tending to the trees that he was planting because he wanted to have a beautiful space for people to live in. So what we understand is that as we work to transform yards, we're also transforming ourselves into something that more closely resembles what God has called us to be. And I need to mention briefly, I can't mention everyone, all of the Haitians who have been part of developing this vision, but I do need to mention uh, Hervé Delisma, also known as Tiga, uh, because Tiga has been particularly key in working with me everywhere we went and helping me think through some of these ideas. And he is also the person who is carrying out this project now in the year that I'm away from the country. Uh, another a uh, critical member has been Li Sien, who lives down the road uh, with his parents from Tiga. And Givenson uh, is just a fun person to mention. He has, he's from Verret, but he has training in agricultural technology. And Givenson is one of those characters that if you say to him, you know, I think maybe we should go one more place. Maybe we need to go up the mountain another three hours. Givenson would say, sure. Another key member of our team that I want to mention is Mary Maud. She's also from Papai, as Tiga and Lee are. Mary Maud is a single mother with, uh, who's been caring for four children, and she's been using her particular yard garden for five years now to provide food for her children and also to send them to school. So as we enter into relationship with an organization, I want, these are the steps that we've been following, more or less. It is a work in progress. The first step is we go in and we present the vision. To the, the leadership tells us where to go, they select the communities, and we present the program. And then the next step is that the community selects people that they think should participate in that program, typically three families. Then we arrange for a farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchange for the people who want to participate in the program, uh, can come and visit farmers who are already doing excellent jobs with their yard gardens. Then we hold a formal workshop. We try to hold the workshop at the center that the organization, where the organization is based. Then we begin moving into the mountains to visit the homes. And we do three steps the first visit. We register the family, we do a yard evaluation, and we do a yard design. After that, it's a matter of keep continuing to go back during the year and visit the families. 
And then we also hold mini workshops where we do short-term planning, where we do evaluation. Then we have a final yard garden evaluation at each yard at the end of the, towards the end of the year. And finally, we have a celebration. Now, what I want to do is take you to Bayonne, uh, the community about 80 miles north of Port-au-Prince, uh, to help you understand exactly how this system has been working. So, in October 2013, Tiga, Marimode, and I went to Bayonne at the invitation of the leaders of the farmer movement of Bayonne. The coordinator of that organization, Virjan, led us to five different communities to present the program. So after walking anywhere from 40 minutes to two hours, we would get to a central place, and then I would lead the group in a, a biblical reflection on Genesis. Tiga would give a, a slideshow showing pictures of the work going on in Papai, Hervé. Mari Maud would give testimony to what the impact of the yard garden in her life. And then we would answer questions. At the end of each presentation, the community, towards the end of the presentation, the community would select three families who they thought should begin to participate in the program. And to end the program, we always had lots and lots of singing. Then in December of 2013, we invited the prospect prospective participants to come do an exchange. They came to Papai, and one of the people they visited was our friend Apollyon, who's also called Tipima, or Little Hot Pepper. And the reason, the reason Apollyon is called Little Hot Pepper is because he's, he's a little wacko. He's a great guy. But he, he wrote this song where he sings about being a hot pepper and the importance of hot, hot pepper has in the life of everybody. Um, and so everybody, you can't tell any of the people who visited him will remember him but they won't remember Apollyon. They'll only remember the guy named T. Piment. In January, uh, we had a team of about six that went to Bayonne and began teaching specific techniques. There are a lot of different things, but some of them that I have pictures for, really good pictures, is teaching people to do compost piles, uh, building benches for the vegetable tires, turning the tires inside out, there were about 15 participants from five, the five different communities, maybe 14. Um, how to do this, how to make a good soil mix for the tires. We also taught how to do raised beds and how to put it all together, how to put the benches up and actually put the tires on them and fill them with soil. And we also taught about red worms. And of course, lots of singing. So in... February, we came back to Bayonne and began our first home visits. And the first thing we do in the home visits is we do the yard evaluation. Um, and Tiga is usually one of the key people that does the evaluation. And what he asks them is, are things that are, try to make, ask questions that are quantitative and they get points for them. Do they have a fence? Do they collect rainwater? Do they have a source of manure? How many fruit trees do they have? Do you have staple, are they growing staple crops in their yard? How many types of medicinal plants, herbal plants do they have? Do they have a latrine? Do they treat their water? And in total, there's 50 points possible. And so they get a score that's their baseline score. And a lot of those questions, uh, if we weren't working through a farmer organization, they would be way too personal. They're not the kinds of things you can't, it's not, the kind of, it's not normal in Haiti for a stranger to come into your yard and say, do you have a latrine? Unless, of course, the stranger actually needs to use it. So a lot of these questions we've developed because by working through the farmer organization and also because we've already been visiting, we've already done the presentation, we've done the exchange, we've done the formal workshop, people have begun to be comfortable with us. So we can ask kind of crazy questions and they're like, that's a little crazy, but okay. Then in, the first, in, in addition, in the first home visit, we do the registration. And that the formatting changed a little bit. Um, with the registration, we ask uh, basic questions like, who is the one who actually takes care of the yard? How far is your water? How far do you have to go to get water? 
what do you produce? What are you already producing? Or what have you produced in the past? What plants have given you the best results? What kind of livestock do you have? And which kind of livestock has given you the best results? And that question always changes. The answer changes whether you're asking the husband or the wife. Because the husband always says cows, because they give the most money. And the wife usually says either chickens, pigs, or goats. Um, usually chickens or goats, because they're the kind of thing that produces frequently and can give her the kind of little bits of money that she needs to keep the family going. What problems have you had with your plants, with your livestock? And what are the things, and most importantly, in that registration we ask them, what are you going to do new? So they have to be thinking through the evaluation and through the work in the workshop and through the visit to the exchanges. We want them to have begun to think about what kinds of changes they want to make in their yard. Not big ones, because we're pragmatists. And finally, what kind of information would help your work? Finally, we go, we do the yard designs. We explore the yards together with the owners. We look at the kind, what they already have, um, what structures are already present, what spaces have they already sort of laid out for their livestock, usually a pig that they have tied up. Do they have, what fences are there? And all of this we're drawing on, paper, on graph paper. Where are the, uh, the trees there? And what shade do they give? We mark the shade. Spaces that are, they normally use for annual crops, where the sun rises and where it sets. We try to indicate the slopes using little arrows. And then once we have all the stuff that already exists, we take that registration and the list of things they want to change, and we place it. We help them place it in their yard so they can graphically see how their yard would look once they do the new stuff. Then when we do the ongoing visits, for example, when we, we visit Bernadette's home, we ask Bernadette, what do you have in production right now in the yard? And of course, we walk around and we actually look at it. What problems have you had this last month or two months since the last time we were here? What have you accomplished? What are you going to do next? And how are you coming along with that plan, that design that we drew with you? And is there any information or any things, anything that we could help you do? And the answer is usually something like, well, yeah, you could pay for my kid's schooling. Not always, but often. And so we always go back to saying, no, we don't have money for that. What we're asking you, are there, are there, is there information that we could provide? Or can we physically help you? We have a little time today. Can we help you do your soil so you can see how to do it better? So we're focusing. As, even if there's a North American, a Blanc, in the yard, what we're trying to keep people to focus on and think about are the kinds of resources that they themselves can pass on to their neighbors. After each set of home visits, we, we gather the people together, all of the participants, and we do an evaluation of the visit. So we ask, what did you like about this visit this last week? What kinds of things should we change? And we also turn it around. We ask team members. So we, say to, so we say, OK, these are the things we really liked about visiting your house. And these were the things that encouraged us. And the next time, you know, maybe we'd like your latrine to be in a little better condition, because it was not much fun pooping there. <laughs> and in terms of planning, we say, what's next? What do we need to do next? And of course, lots of singing. So at the end of the year, and specifically in Bayonne, it was in November of 2014, we did the last, the end of the year evaluation. And in Bayonne, of the 14 original families, one, dro uh, one dropped out immediately. So of the 14 that really began to do the work, there were 12 that were still working on their yards in November. And of those 12, 11 scored higher at the end than at the beginning, most of them 15 points or more. Specifically, Wos Marie uh, got the highest score of anybody. She got 47 out of 50. And I'm going to talk about the evaluation so you have an understanding of what that actually meant that she did. She started out with uh, 22. 
So in that evaluation, these are the kinds of, these are specifically the things. I've mentioned a few, but these are the, all of them. And this evaluation came out of six years of walking, of working in Papai, walking from house to house, not just thinking what people should have, but seeing what people already have, the kinds of things that they're doing that are really cool. And so what we wanted to do is both challenge people for, to do new things, but also recognize the value of, of the kinds of work that they're already doing in their yard. So a yard design is three points. A protected area that they can have more uh, guarantee of success, more uh, predictability. System for capturing rainwater, permanent source of manure, compost, redworms, space for perennial vegetable production, vegetable tires, raised vegetable beds, staple crops, fruit trees, medicine plants, uh, trash collection, latrines, treated water, and also five points for the beauty of the yard. So I, I want to go through those and just give you a sense of what, how that works. How much time? Uh, you've got 10 minutes. OK. I think that's, that's about right. OK, an example in Notaire and Alagier's yard in Bayonne, this is the design. And the importance of the design, as I understand them, is that they help families begin to envision in concrete ways the abundance that they can actually produce in their yard. So it's putting something there, sort of, it's not solid in one sense, but it is in another. It's something visible that says, you can do this. This is where you want your yard to go. This is a good example of a protected space in Leogan, the mountains of Leogan, about a four hour walk up the mountain where Brino lives. He used bamboo and uh, palm, uh, palm leaves to, to block off an area where he could plant crops that would otherwise be ravaged by pigs or, or a, a random mule. Collecting rainwater, uh, obviously water is extremely important. Uh, we talk with people about doing what they can with what they have, of using whatever they have available, putting it up on the roof, and begin collecting the blessing that comes from the heavens. We're also playing with ideas, exploring options for making water more available. And uh, one of those uh, came from a friend of mine from Asheville, North Carolina, named Buzz, which is a hydraulic ram pump. Buzz is a farmer in northern, uh, western North Carolina, who uses a hydraulic ram pump that he put together, he created himself to grow vegetables. So he came down and he worked with us on the idea. We also work with them on how to collect the water that comes uh, from the rain. Uh, relatively cheap way of doing that is an in-ground cistern. And in September of 2014, we built an in-ground cistern as part of a workshop in Leogan for about $125. And we calculated its capacity was 700 gallons. So that's a pretty good ratio, but $125 is still too much money for most Haitian families. That particular technique uh, I learned from folks that work in southern Honduras, an organiza grassroots organization called Cosecha. This past uh, April, I was also able to be part of a project in the, mountain, in the mountains of Veret, where the organization coordinated with MPP, with uh, engineer and technicians, to build ferro-cement cisterns, uh, three of them, in a part of the, the mountains where there is no other source, nearby source. The closest source of running water to that, those communities uh, is about an hour and a half, two hours walk away, three, uh, three hour trip, two and a half to three hour trip. Um, and so the only source of water they have is rainwater. It's critical to be open to new ideas, to be willing to change. All of that is definitely true. But the impact of the real impact of the yard gardens is dependent on techniques that represent relatively simple changes. For example, asking people to value their animals' poop, which in Haiti, they don't. So we talk with people about having a permanent source of manure. So if they have a cow, not tie it away from the yard, but to at least at night bring it into the yard. If they have a mule, don't leave it out in the garden, in the, large, in the far away garden, bring it into their yard where they can collect the manure. And if they have pigs, treat the manure carefully, but work on finding ways to use it. 
In Verret, Canol and his son invented this system for working with their manure, goat manure, turkey manure, and pig manure. They would put it in the middle of the two tires, and when the two tires were full, sort of shake them up and lift them up so that the manure would mix together, sort of get ground up, and fall down below. And then they would use wastewater from the house to moisten the manure so that it was constantly uh, composting, it was constantly rotting. And they were, the difference that they found was quite significant in terms of their capacity to grow vegetables in that yard. They got three points, they got six points, three points for having a permanent source of manure, and three points for composting. So we also work with people with red worms. Leeksen is someone on top of the mountains. He walked down the mountains, took public transportation to MPP. Red PP gave him California red worms. He brought them back up to Leogan, walked back up the mountain, and began raising the red worms. And he and his wife, Leeksen and Marie de Lud, have seen the difference that the vermicompost can make in their lives. Perennial vegetables, moringa, of course, but we also uh, talk to people about Haitian basket vine. They already know about the Haitian basket vine, but they don't tend to plant it in their yards. We also talk about the, uh, the uses of alabar spinach, and we have some people who have been trying out the Okinawa spinach as well. So planting something once and getting a crop over a long period of time. In Verret, we have uh, a woman named Cecilia, who after one workshop went back to her home and having listened about the importance of Moringa, began gathering Moringa and making Moringa powder. In Bayonne, Noter and his wife, uh, Alajir group, planted a patch of Moringa in their backyard, took very good care of it. In four months, it was already big. They started consuming the leaves. About two months after they started doing their yard garden experiment, uh, Alajir gave birth to their second child. And six months after the child was born, she took, him, she took the boy to the local clinic for a six-month checkup, and the nurse congratulated her because the baby was exactly the right size and the right weight. And Notaire test, gave testimony to us and to his neighbors that the reason his wife and his children were in such good health was because of the moringa that he had planted behind their house. Estern is a great example of producing vegetables. He and his wife brought the tires up from down below on the back of a borrowed mule, planted them to the kinds of things they wanted, garlic, chive, garlic chives, green peppers, amaranth. They have their patch of moringa. And they've been eating. Every time we go to Esteran's house, he's got vegetables growing in those tires for three years now. We've also, since 2013, been talking with people about adding biochar, producing vegetables in raised beds, they get three points if they have a four meter long bed that's about a meter wide and it's in production for at least six months. Staple crops, people already do staple crops. We're recognizing that that's an important strategy for, for having food available when other things aren't. Fruits, for our purposes, a coconut is considered a fruit tree. Um, most people do have fruit trees but because we make it a point to talk about fruit trees, they came back at us and said, why don't you teach us, why don't you work with us on grafting? So this past October, Tiga was able to coordinate with a master grafter and do grafting workshops with the three organizations. Medicinal plants, we've come to very much respect, particularly me, respect the power that the natural, some of the natural plants and the knowledge that people have to use them for curing. Trash collection, uh, it's pretty simple. If we go into your yard and we see trash, you don't get three points. If we go into your yard, we don't see trash, you do. Um, and you need to tell us what you do with it. So people may have a lot of trash the first time they, we visit. By the second or third visit, we usually don't find any. Three points for latrines. The latrine has three criteria. It has a roof, so you can do what you need even in the rain that the hole is big enough to be comfortable for an adult, but small enough that your children are comfortable using it as well. If you got that, those three things, you got your points for latrines. Treating water is more complicated, but in the high mountains, one of the only viable sort, uh, ways that people can treat water is by having a bucket with a spigot that they can treat with bleach. Aesthetics, finally, five points. 
It's pretty simple. We go into the yard, we ask ourselves, how do we feel? Does the yard seem organized? Does it feel cared for? And is it beautiful? So that's the criteria that we used for Rosemarie. And Tiga is more of a pain in the butt than I am. He's very hard to get points from. So it was a big deal that Rosemarie got those 47 points. And when a, a, a family gets, when a farmer, a participant gets more than 40 points, we make a certificate and give it to them at the end of the year. So at the end of the year, finally, the end of year celebration in November, uh, they put on a show. And farmer groups are excellent at doing a lot of things. But a party, they're really great. There was some of everything, dancing, biblical reflection, messages, skits, the giving people their diplomas, and of course, lots of singing. So there's some key things about what makes this stuff, this work. But one of the most important things in both the Dominican and in Haiti is to remember that we're not responsible for the success that our job is to help create the space for the Holy Spirit to blow through.